Okay, perfect. And um, so we just, I just wanted to pick up from where we left off last week. Um, and again, my name is Maureen McGuire. I am a PhD candidate in the History of Art and Visual Culture Department at UCSC. This is, I'm just finishing up my fourth year. Uh, and so I've officially started writing the dissertation. Um, and uh, although this is not exactly the topic that I'm writing about, we will touch on that. So um, I'll get to talk about that probably in one of the next two um, sessions, not today, but in the very near future. Um, and it, just in case my, my little dog likes to sit on the, the cushion behind me. So if you hear any barking, it's just my dog. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the title of the course, Neither Venus or Virgin, addresses this aspect of women's lives in late antiquity and Byzantium, that they were stuck within this spectrum of what uh, the stereotypes of women were, that they were either these um, insatiable, sex-crazed um, creatures, wild creatures, or they were these uh, perfect virgins. And so these were the, this was the stereotype. And women, of course, fell within this, this spectrum because really there was no way for them to be as perfect as Mary the Virgin. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. We didn't get into it too much last week. Um, here we go. So the imagery that we're going to look at is rooted in a lot of the imagery that we looked at last week with that classical tradition um, and the appearance of women in those kinds of images. And an iconography is the, are the visual images, the symbols or the modes of representation um, collectively associated with a person, cult or movement. So um, we can think of, uh, you know, political groups developing an iconography for themselves, maybe slogans or something like that, even, even today. Um, I, I think of uh, modern music um, genres that start to develop and develop their own iconographies and slogans and dance moves and things like that. So these are kind of the, what we're talking about with what iconography means. <clears throat> Um, and new religions often experience this period, and so Christianity is no different, because it was rooted in um, the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew tradition, it did have some of those um, elements to it, but because it was so deeply impacted by the Mediterranean classical past, there are a lot of elements um, that we'll see that, that, that Christian iconography borrowed as well. Um, and so Christian artists slowly developed their own iconography, but it was firm, firmly rooted in the iconography of the classical Mediterranean world. The earliest Christian symbols were, uh, for example, the chi and the rho symbol and the fish symbol. And these were very common because they were kind of difficult to interpret, but they allowed Christians to identify them, but not any Roman persecutors. So they, they just seem really innocuous, you know? Um, so the Cairo is the symbol of the first two letters of the word Christos, Christ, in Greek. So the X here is the K sound, and it looks like a P, but in Greek, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Greek, uh, ancient Greek uh, language, is the R sound. So this is the first two letters of Christos, um, one of the monikers of Jesus Christ. And then we see it here within this wreath, which is a, a traditional Roman symbol of like power. You know, you'd get wreaths um, as a crown, perhaps for victory. Um, and then the fish symbol has to do with uh, connections to what some of his first followers, uh, their, their careers, essentially. So they were fishermen. Um, and then we have this biblical tradition of fishers of men. Um, and so we have the anchor here that looks like a, like a cross um, that's, that kind of helps um, connect it to Christianity more firmly. And then the fish here. Uh, and of course, these are symbols that we still associate with Christianity today. 
The other place that we see these images uh, for the most part are in the funerary context. And so we looked at some of the images for, uh, last week of a funerary context in ancient Greece. But let's talk about uh, how the funerary context changes because the, the idea of the afterlife is significantly different between the ancient Greek um, and the Hebrew practice and the Roman practice and the Christian practice. So for the ancient Greeks, the afterlife was this shadowy place. Um, it was not fun. <laughs> uh, there was no paradise that anyone went to. And for the ancient Greeks, the, the goal in life was to have a healthy, successful, exciting physical life. It was not the afterlife. And this contrasts sharply with the concept of the ancient Egyptian um, afterlife, which was more paradisical. You, you remained this in the same um, career as in your physical life, uh, and you were reborn in this wonderful uh, place with abundance and, and lots of water and lots of food and ideally lots of beer. So the Christian idea is, is a little bit more similar to the ancient Egyptian um, idea in that you were going to heaven and it was going to be paradise and you had been redeemed and all of these other concepts. So uh, most of the funerary contexts that we have for the, uh, for the earliest Christians are from these catacombs. And uh, these were burial places underneath um, the ground. And the deceased was usually laid in these little niches here. Um, so you were just sort of put in kind of like on a shelf here. And depending on your wealth and status, uh, your tomb area, your, your catacomb area might be uh, highly decorated. And so if we take a look at this uh, cubiculum N, uh, cubiculum is just a Latin word for for room, and uh, we see that this cubiculum is beautifully decorated with lots of frescoes. We see uh, this sort of pediment here, this niche right here with beautiful decoration. We have some peacocks, and then this niche here would have been used for various offerings, and then the deceased would, would lay down here. But we even see some carved out columns. So all of this it would have been carved out of the rock um, underneath this, just outside the city walls of Rome. Similarly, the Christian um, cubiculum, cubicula, were uh, decorated beautifully. And early on, um, so this is from the fourth century, uh, and this illustrates a number yeah, of. Got it. A number of images uh, that seem, again, sort of uh, unclear to the to the to the viewer. the The narrative is a little ambiguous, and this benefited Christians because it allowed them to develop this iconography to decorate their spaces, as was appropriate for a wealthy uh, family, um, but also allowed them to celebrate their Christian identity. So uh, this is from the catacomb of Saints Peter and Marcellinus, and we see that there are the this loon, uh, this tondo in the center, and then some lunettes on the side. So let's just take a look at them um, and see what we're looking at. So in the center we have this good shepherd, and we see that the young man has no beard, and he's carrying this sheep on the back of, on, on his shoulders. He also is surrounded by this vegetation and some little animals here. It's hard to tell what kind of animals they are, probably other sheep. And this aligns with the quote from the book of John, um, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So this is a great image because it mimics images of Apollo uh, from roughly this time period. So here we have another good shepherd figure. Um, he's not really holding the sheep as tightly. It's kind of balancing on, on his shoulders. He's not even holding it at all. But again, surrounded by the vegetation, some other sheep and the little birds in the trees there are really great as well. 
And if we take a look at other images of this good shepherd figure, we notice the similarities to images of Apollo. So this is from, uh, the image on the right is from Libya uh, from the second century BC. So about 200, 300 years, um, sorry, 500 years uh, previous. But we see that just like the Christ figure here, the good shepherd figure, there is no beard. This is a representation of the figure's youth. Um, and so with youth, uh, an age, we often see either a beard or no beard. So a young person, a male, would not have a beard. So the usefulness of this figure of the Good Shepherd is important here. As I was putting the slides together, I was also curious about any possible references to King David, who, uh, as some of you may be familiar, the Hebrew King David was a shepherd early in his life as well, before he became the king. And so I was kind of wondering if there was maybe this influence of King David being youthful and a shepherd and as a um, precursor or foreshadowing Jesus. So I, I, I haven't really uh, researched that very much, but it was something that um, crossed my mind. And again, um, I just want to reiterate, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I'm not very good at checking the chat. So if you just interrupt me, that's better for me. Uh, but what I really liked about this uh, Libyan Apollo on the right was his contrapposto stance, right? And contrapposto is this kind of S curve that's created um, in the body. So we have this jutting hip up that is um, contrasted with the movement of the shoulders here. So you kind of get this X almost that's created by the body. So this is called a, a contrapposto in Italian, or it's this chiastic pose um, in, in the Greek reference. But we see that, that S curve, that contrapposto in the, uh, the Christ figure, the good shepherd here on the left too. So we see these very clear references to the classical past, especially uh, the visual culture. Let's return to the fresco um, at the Catacomb of Saints Peter and Marcellinus. So we just took a look at the Good Shepherd, and now I want us to take a look at the, um, the uh, lunettes on the side. And the first one I wanna draw your attention to is this one over here. We have the story of Jonah. And the story of Jonah is also another foreshadowing of uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. And Jonah was uh, this kind of prophet figure. He's fraught with many uh, <laughs> problems. One of them was that he was on a boat and he was thrown over the side. Um, and so we see this here, we see this boat, and then a man here who's kind of being tossed overboard. Um, He's, it's not very active, it's sort of static. He's just sort of like hovering over the water here. And then here is uh, a whale on the side. And uh, it doesn't look like any whale that I've ever seen, but of course, um, you know, artists probably didn't go out on boats to observe what whales looked like. So they just did their best in their imagination. It's kind of this snake-like, lizard-like uh, creature. So here he is being thrown over the boat. What I also like about this image is that it could easily, easily be interpreted as an image of maybe Odysseus, right? Something happening with the Odyssey here. Uh, many wealthy Christians were still familiar with the, uh, the Odyssey, um, the Iliad, and other uh, Greek myths, Roman myths, the, the Aeneid, for example. And so this is, again, sort of ambiguous. Is it Jonah? Is it the Odyssey? It's not clear. On the opposite side, we have the next episode in Jonah's uh, experience when uh, after three days, the whale spits Jonah out of his mouth. And so we have this, this same serpent-like whale here, uh, kind of poking its head up above the water and we see his tail here again snake-like and then Jonah coming out and he looks really really happy about this mm -hmm. and uh, I really was amazed when uh, I think it was a few years ago a scuba diver actually did get swallowed by a whale for about 30 seconds um, 
this was over like on the East Coast, he was um, uh, fishing for lobster. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I think for, for many years, everyone was like, oh, that could never happen. But ah, here it is. <laughs> it does happen. Not for three days. But uh, anyway. Uh, okay, so here we have these images again, but they, they could be um, read as sort of images from the Odyssey. And if we take a look at the bottom here, we have another episode of Jonah's life. Um, and this is an episode when Jonah goes out into the, the world and he um, creates this space for himself in the wilderness. And God sends this, this plant to create shade for him. And so we have that scene here. But this again is a little ambiguous because the image, oh, sorry. The image looks uh, very much like, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thought, okay. So there's the Bible references. Okay. Okay, so if we're looking at this one, we see this reclining figure here. And this is traditionally, this sort of reclining male figure is traditionally associated with Endymion. And Endymion was the beloved of Selene, who we see here. And Selene was the goddess of the moon uh, in the Roman tradition. And uh, she fell in love with Endymion and she asked Jupiter to basically let him sleep forever so that uh, when she across the sky, she, sh she could go down and just look at him every night. So if we take a closer look here, we see this arm over his head. He's sort of leaning on his, his elbow here. His legs are out sort of crossed in this way. So it's very clear that the artist of the, uh, the fresco at the catacomb of Saints uh, Peter and Marcellinus was familiar with many of these classical sculptures, these visual tropes that are so common um, in classical uh, works of art and then were borrowed and adapted for Christian contexts. We see this also in other sculptures. So on the right, we have a, uh, an image of Jesus uh, as he is seated. And this is amazingly similar to this third century sculpture of Serapis. And Serapis was this sort of Egypt Roman deity, divinity. Um, and here we see him with Cerberus. So this divinity that had to do with the underworld. Cerberus is, of course, the guardian of the underworld, this three-headed dog. Uh, but we have this enthroned male figure with this feet position that allows for the artist to demonstrate his skill with drapery. Um, so this allows for us to get a sense of the figure's body beneath the, the drapery, which was uh, a goal of many artists at the time. And we have that same interest here uh, in the Christ figure. Note here also that Jesus still looks like this young Apollo. Uh, this, uh, and Apollo was associated with learning, with healing, with the sun. And these are also uh, the S-U-N sun. And so these ideas translate fairly easily onto this figure of Christ, this God, this divinity who is associated with uh, with healing, with, you know, new life, uh, rebirth. Um, and so uh, these were applied onto how Jesus appears in many early images. Uh, we also get this aspect of his uh, regalness, his imperial power, if you will, through this throne that he's seated on. Many emperors are illustrated on thrones. And so he's given this kind of political power as well. And of course, politics and religion were, you couldn't separate them uh, in the late antique and, and even, you know, up until recently, um, religion and church and state, if you will, were intrinsically uh, entwined. I also uh, was starting to wonder as I was putting this, uh, this 
talk together. Whether or not the artist who created this uh, late fourth century seated Jesus was familiar with the chryselephantine um, sculpture of Zeus at Olympia. Uh, this was a huge sculpture at Olympia in Greece. And uh, it illustrated Zeus enthroned uh, in majesty. And this uh, particular sculpture was elephant, Chris Elephantine, which means it was a wooden sculpture, a wooden core that was covered in ivory and gold. Chris, Chrysos meaning gold and elephantine meaning the ivory from an elephant. Uh, and so it was just this fabulous sculpture. It would have taken many, many tusks to cover this uh, with with the ivory and lots of gold uh probably just the the uh just the foil um not full pieces of gold but um to decorate this so i was curious uh, i started to wonder if perhaps artists were also recalling this image of zeus enthroned kind of transferring these ideas of jupiter and zeus onto this figure of christ so lots of bending, adapting, and borrowing, and, and remolding, recasting to fit the Christian needs. And again, here we have a, a, a carving of Septimius Severus. Um, Septimius Severus is seated here on a throne. So again, this imperial power, this religious uh, divine power uh, associated with these seated male figures. This is one of my favorite images of the Good Shepherd. Um, this is from a fourth century, sorry, early fifth century. It's called the, the Mausoleum of Gala Placidia. And uh, folks were interred there, but I don't think the woman Gala Placidia was interred there. There's no evidence that she was. And we're not entirely sure if she intended this to be her tomb, um, but it did result in being a tomb. Um, Gala Placidia was a, uh, uh, I think it was her, uh, the daughter of Theodosius I, one of the uh, most important emperors in the early uh, church. He actually outlawed pagan religion and made Christianity the official religion of the empire. And so she was closely associated with uh, this, this political figure, and she was uh, insanely wealthy. So she was able to adorn the interior of this small chapel mausoleum. Um, and this is a mosaic from the interior. And we see that uh, instead of this uh, young guy holding a sheep over his shoulders, we have Christ seated in this paradisical setting. And we're reminded that this is paradise because of these four springs that uh, sort of emerge from these rocks. So there's one here, 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 and then over here. And in the Bible, there is this reference to the four uh, rivers that spring from, the, from Eden, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. So again, we have this Apollo-looking Jesus figure, Christ figure, and he has this beautiful gold um, tunic on, long tunic, and then he is draped with this purple... Uh, cloth. And here again, we have concepts of, of political power applied onto this divine figure. Uh, purple was the color of the emperor. Um, only very elite um, imperial family members could wear purple. And this is because the dye was so expensive to create purple garments. It was extracted from the shells of these mollusks. And so it was very difficult to acquire, very difficult to extract. It was extremely expensive. So purple uh, porphyry, if you will, in Greek is associated very closely with the imperial household and political power. We also see the cross. And so instead of like a shepherd's crook, uh, the Christ figure here is holding this cross. And the cross has an interesting history in Christianity because very early on, it was not considered uh, appropriate to display. Uh, crucifixion was um, the lowest form of corporal punishment and um, 
public execution that anyone could experience. So for this divine power to have been executed in this uh, sort of embarrassing way, many early Christians did not want to illustrate the cross or to uh, illustrate Jesus crucified. One of the earliest uh, images we have of the crucifixion is on a very small ivory box. It's in the British Museum now. Um, and Jesus sort of hovers over the cross. He's just kind of like hanging out there. His, his face, there is no facial expression. So we don't see crosses uh, too much in early Christian art. This becomes important uh, later on. Uh, so here we have this cross as a symbol rather than Christ crucified. Um, so just keep that in mind as we as we watch these images uh, sort of shift over time. It's, it's quite interesting to me. And this is an important image uh, if, it, if this space is a mausoleum because of course it references the redemption of the living um, to go to paradise where, where Christ is sort of enthroned in this paradisical setting. And um, so here's that, that excerpt from, the, from Genesis, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, what the first two rivers are, but we definitely know where the Tigris and the Euphrates are today. This image of Christ bearded does not emerge until a little bit later, but this too has roots in um, classical antiquity. Um, this illustrates Jesus as this wise philosopher, um, just like here we have Socrates uh, illustrated as this wise philosopher with a beard. In the ancient world, um, in the Mediterranean especially, beards were associated not only with age, but also with wisdom. And so if you uh, had a beard, a male was depicted with a beard, he was usually uh, the, the uh, importance of his wisdom, coupled with his age is, is emphasized in, in that image. So here we have um, a mosaic from Palermo um, and this illustrates Jesus uh, with this beard. And he also has a book. Um, this can be viewed as the book of judgment or it could just be the Bible. But again, books are associated with wisdom just as these beards are associated, associated with wisdom. So classic imagery was not abandoned entirely. Uh, the wealthy still referenced non-Christian religious images and myths because this kind of knowledge uh, was a display of their wealth and their elite status, their ability to go to school, their ability to talk with other learned people, et cetera. So we still see these classical images. They're not abandoned despite this pagan um, association with many of these myths and stories. Now, the Virgin Mary uh, also develops this unique iconography, and we see it shift over time. Um, so uh, we see her as a young woman uh, working in um, creating a textile here. She's working on creating the tabernacle uh, veil here, and then we see her with the Christ child seated on her lap. And then we also see her in this sort of orant pose with her arms raised to the side um, in various uh, motifs. This is with the, this would be aligned with the crucifixion in this moment of mourning for, for the Virgin. So uh, when we talk about the Virgin, there are a number of events from her life that are obviously important, but the four probably most important for her are the Immaculate Conception, um, and this is when Mary was conceived by her mother, Anna. Um, and this is easy to get confused with the Annunciation because that is also a moment of conception. Um, but the Annunciation is a little bit different. The Annunciation is when 
Mary conceives of Jesus. So there are these two moments of conception for associated with Mary. And it's called the Immaculate Conception uh, for Mary because she was born without sin um, in that she did not have this original sin that Eve bestowed on essentially all of us, right, who uh, are, are born with this sin already attached to us. Mary did not have that sin attached to her. We know the life of Mary from a few apocryphal texts. Uh, the earliest one is called the Proto-Evangelion of James. It's a really interesting text if you ever get a copy of it. Um, it is available at the UCSC library in a digital format. And I really encourage you to take a look at it. It's really wonderful. There's this moment actually when the author describes Joseph having this super, I don't know, it's kind of like the Matrix movie or something. And, Time stands still for Joseph, uh, the the spouse of of the Virgin Mary, and he's watching like birds fly in like slow mo. It's really interesting. Highly encourage you to take a look at it. Um, so we do have some record of this this life of Mary, and then from the biblical record from the New Testament, we do have moments of the Annunciation, the Visitation, etc. Uh, the Dormition is also described in um, the Proto-Evangelion of James. The Annunciation is when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and, and lets her know, hey, you're, you're going to have a baby, and she kind of, you know, obviously freaks out. The Visitation is when Mary visits with her cousin, who has also conceived this sort of miracle baby, um, John the Baptist. Uh, he's also called John Prodromos in, um, in the Greek tradition. And then the Dormition is when Mary has her corporeal death, uh, and her whole body is actually taken up to heaven, so there are no relics of Jesus's physical body or the Virgin's physical body, um, and relics are usually bones or pieces of cloth um, uh, of a significant um, religious person, saints, um, the apostles and things like that. But there are no bones of Jesus or Mary. There are these contact relics. So we have like the shroud of, you know, Turin, for example, or um, for a long time, we had the girdle of the Virgin and actually in Chartres Cathedral in Paris, there's still um, this textile that belonged to Mary as well. Um, okay, so in images of the Annunciation uh, from very early on, they're quite different from maybe some of the images of the Annunciation that we look at in um, the Renaissance or uh, in European medieval works of art. And this just has um, to do with the tradition of um, looking at the Proto-Evangelion because it was an apocryphal text. Uh, it wasn't super accepted by the church, uh, especially the Roman church. Um, but According to the Proto-Evangelion, Mary was collecting water when she, uh, when Angel Gabriel appeared to her. So here we have a cover from a book, a manuscript, and this is just a very small uh, vignette from that cover made of ivory from Italy. And we see here that we have the angel Gabriel appearing to this young woman and she's very beautifully dressed she has this really nice um, necklace on and she has this pitcher of water and then the water is coming out of this crevice in presumably a rock here so she's collecting this water and I really like this imagery rather than some of the other imagery that we see later on of her reading a book or we'll also see some images of her um, working with this textile again but this idea of filling an empty container with water is very similar to this idea of conception, right? So her, just as this empty container is going to be filled with water, her empty container of her womb is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and she will then conceive uh, Jesus Christ, right? Um, and so if we take a look very closely at the actual lines that the artist has created here, we have this line going from his head, right, down into this ewer of water, this empty 
carafe. Um, and so it's, it's as if this wonderful sort of connection is drawn between the two. And we also see that the ewer of water is directly across from the virgin's belly. So they act not only as these literary devices, but here the artist has created this visual device to really emphasize and drive home what's happening theologically. And this is one of the things I really love about looking at images like this is the, the theological clarity that comes with some of these images. They're really difficult to understand like, okay, well, how can a, how can a woman conceive a child without, you know, having sex or intercourse? And, you know, it's just kind of this miraculous thing. Um, so I really love that. In other images, this is an actually, uh, this is from Croatia um, in a beautiful uh, basilica, uh, the Euphrasian Basilica. If, uh, I really want to go there. I haven't had a chance to go, but it, it looks beautiful. This is another interpretation of the Annunciation. Here, though, uh, the Virgin is not collecting water. Um, she is working this textile, and you'll have to forgive this, like, there's a bar that's over the, the front of this that's that prevented the photographer from getting the whole mosaic. Uh, it's not cut off like this, um, but because of this visual impediment that's there. So here we have the angel Gabriel, and he is again speaking to Mary, and sort of this gesture like this is often uh, a symbol of that that the person is talking, the figure is talking. So uh, the angel Gabriel is talking and he's appearing to Mary here. And this is a gesture of thought. So she's kind of like surprised or thoughtful. She's listening uh, to um, the angelic figure here. In the Proto-Evangelion of James, uh, the Virgin Mary is one of the young women selected to weave this textile for the tabernacle in the big temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the temple had not yet been uh, destroyed. That was destroyed by uh, Titus a few years later on. So the temple in Jerusalem was still standing and these young women were charged with creating textiles to adorn the interior. And uh, Mary was selected to weave the scarlet or the purple cloth. And so here we have, again, this empty, well, this filled vase with the the cloth for the holy of holies in the temple and we see that she actually has this cloth draped over her her legs here and this is another wonderful symbol for the conception of jesus uh women were tasked with creating textiles let me check the time here okay uh with creating textiles and weaving a textile was almost synonymous with weaving the flesh of a child in a woman's womb. And so by having these symbolic acts that the Virgin is engaged in, she's weaving this textile just as the angel is announcing. And we have this, again, this wonderful diagonal of the, uh, the angel and his gaze is directed at her womb again. Um, and so we have this active, sort of magical spiritual moment happening of this miraculous conception a and that is rhyming with the virgin creating this, this textile for the holy of holies of the temple uh, so i just again i just love the ways that these express wonderful really challenging theological concepts in digestible understandable ways um and uh sorry is a uh, Maureen, I yes. have a que question on that last one. Please. When, I, what's striking in here is the halo around Mary. So what was the origin of this halo? I mean, that that's certainly a, didn't exist in ancient time, did it? No, it didn't. Well, not in the ancient Mediterranean. Um, this is one of my favorite um, culture cross-cultural exchanges. The halo is actually a Hindu or Buddhist tradition. Mm. And because there was so much 
cross-cultural exchange between the Mediterranean and Central Asia at the time. Um, they were getting silks from, uh, so the Romans wanted like Chinese silks and the Chinese wanted wine and oil. So there was this wonderful cross-culturation between the two. The halo is only meant to signify to the viewer that this is an important person. Um, and this gets to the idea, and we see this in a lot of texts, of the aura, if you will, of these uh, revered figures that they sort of glow internally, right? And they glow and you, you can see this in their like aura. Um, and so this is kind of a reflection of that idea that they're glowing internally, that they're so special that they emit this light. And so that's kind of a, a symbolic way to, to capture what these people really looked like in, in their real lives. So yeah, great question, great question. Because we don't always see the, the halo as well. We saw that in the, um, the Gala Placidia mosaic, but it's not always, it doesn't always appear in early Christian art. So there is this um, increased appearance of, of a halo. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay. So although the Virgin is the paragon of femininity, um, and this paragon that really no woman could achieve because of course, unlike the Virgin Mary, other women are born with uh, original sin, if you will, this um, stain from, from Eve. So there's no way any other woman can achieve the, the perfection of the Virgin. And uh, so the ways that other women appear are quite different from the Virgin. Um, so again, we have these symbols that are attached to Christian women, and these evolve out of uh, classical traditions. Um, so again, we have the symbols of the, the fish and the anchor and the Cairo, um, and these allowed women to, to identify themselves as Christian, but in a sort of secret way. So if we take a look at this early third century sarcophagus of an elite woman, we see that, um, so this is from the side of a, basically a coffin, a stone coffin. So here we have the central figure, a female. And so this was the deceased. This is the woman who was laid to rest in, inside the sarcophagus. But what she wants us to know about her is that she's extremely smart that she was uh, an elite woman, that she was learned, and that she could sort of hold her own with her, her male colleagues. So she's in the center here, and she's um, outlined by this wonderful architectural space. And actually, you can see a textile behind her. And women, again, are, are closely associated with textiles, um, but textiles are all, were also... Uh, in, instead of doors, like physical doors that you had to open and close, textiles were used to divide spaces um, and, and they could be moved very easily to enlarge a space or make a space smaller. So um, it's important for us to think about uh, the ways that textiles um, played a role in, in life. You know, curtains would have been everywhere. Um, unlike today, they're just sort of over windows and things, right? Um, so she's uh, outline, she's framed by this architectural space and she's pushed forward into the viewer's space with this textile behind her. On either side, she has these uh, learned men here with the beards um, and they're all holding scrolls. Um, and sometimes these are called rotula or one is a rotulus. Um, so uh, they're all holding scrolls. And these are symbols that they could read, that they could read uh, all kinds of texts, philosophies, uh, epics, poetry, um, scientific material. So they were engaging in all of this learning through their, their um, connection to these, these scrolls. And they're actually, again, talking to one another. We see this 
this gesture here on the right, he's talking to these young men. And here we actually have another young woman. So this might be a family of learned people. Um, and these, the, this is the mother. Uh, this could be a father or a husband and a father or a husband on the other side, I'm not sure which. Uh, perhaps sons are around her as well. And then we have this um, image of Cupid here. Um, and Cupid often appears in little uh, vignettes like this. This could be a symbol of um, love, whether or not the, the marriage that she had was a loving one. Uh, most marriages were arranged and very possibly loveless and quite unhappy. But by including Cupid, you're giving the public this this, this idea that it was a loving and, and happy marriage. Um, and the female here is holding a rotulus. Um, she's holding a scroll. She has her head um, covered. So she's displaying herself as this wonderful, proper Roman matron. She is the head of this household. She has taught her children, her uh, father or the other men in her life have taught her children and her to read and engage with these wonderful texts. So I really love this uh, sarcophagus. Another sarcophagus illustrates a female quite similarly. So we still have her in this architectural frame um, with these kind of uh, uh, gosh, arch uh, behind her. This is great because we have her name, Crispina. Um, and so we know that she, uh, who this individual is rather than the previous sarcophagus that we looked at, we don't get a sense of who that figure is. And here she's holding a codex or a manuscript. Um, this is just like a rotulus or a scroll. It's a symbol of her learning and her um, facility with philosophy and religion and other important texts. But here we have the Cairo symbol on the front. And so this identifies the text that she's holding the codex or manuscript as a Christian uh, book. Uh, and so she's identifying herself with her name and her religion with the book that she's holding, in addition to the fact that she's, she's displaying herself as very smart and learned, um, and she is familiar with the Christian texts. Very early on, we do have a number of women who are important Christian leaders, and they were connected with Peter and Paul. Lydia was a businesswoman, and we know her um, also as a, a um, businesswoman associated with purple dye. And so she probably had a lot of money because purple dye, again, was very expensive. It was produced for elite people. And so she's probably extremely wealthy. We also have Priscilla and Phoebe. These are so, just some of the women directly referenced in the New Testament in one of uh, the, the books there. Mostly in the letters and in the Acts of the Apostles, we, we see these women. Um, and many of these women uh were wealthy and this put them in a unique position for the early church because they could open their households to uh to spaces for gathering for christians and they could basically afford to uh proselytize um so the the spiritual me meals that the um, early Christians celebrated together. You had to have a large space for gathering. You had to have enough money to feed a number of people. Um, and so many of these business women were extremely important figures in the very early church. These are the women who could also pay for people like Paul to get out of jail, right? They would have connections to help with this mission to get people out of jail, to pay for people to go to certain places. So these women were extremely important. And women especially were drawn to the Christian religion uh, very early on before it became sort of a politicized religious movement because it did advocate for equality among genders, right? Numerous times in the Bible it says, there's, there's no difference between woman or man, Gentile or Jew, um, slave or free, etc. So there is this aspect of egalitarianism that was embedded in early Christianity. 
that women were attracted to. So women were extremely important very early on and their roles started to diminish and erode over time. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So many women in early Christian art appear with symbols of their ability to read. They appear in these biblical narratives. Um, they appear uh, in these attitudes of speaking or they appear in these attitudes of prayer. Um, so they're very closely aligned with this spiritual aspect of their identity, this Christian identity that they wanted to promote in these works of art. Um, the earliest church structures were uh, based on the, um, the house, the Roman house uh, footprint or ground plan uh, blueprint. And so this is one of the earliest examples of a house church. We, we clearly know that it's a house church um, because some of, you know, some of the spaces, it's very ambiguous. Is it a house or is it a house church? It's not clear. Um, so this is the baptistry of the house church in Dura Europos, which is in modern Syria. And Dura Europos is a really fascinating place because uh, not far from this uh, space, there was a synagogue, there was a, a temple to Isis, the Egyptian deity, uh, there was a temple, uh, I believe there was a Mithraeum, so um, if you're familiar with um, Mithridates, uh, this kind of Roman divinity, um, there's, there's a Mithraeum. So this was a really diverse, very small community uh, it was abandoned um, sometime around 250 AD. So this was constructed sometime between the first and uh, the first and the third centuries. We're not entirely sure when, but this is the baptistry space. And so we have some of the frescoes that uh, adorned the interior. So this is one of the fragments that we have. And then this would be the, the pool or the tub in which the person would uh, the initiate would, you know, be dunked in the, in the baptismal waters. And what I really like about this particular space is um, just as we had the sort of rhyming of the images, the alignment of the images in the mosaics and the book cover, we have this alignment in the physical space as well. So the tomb, uh, although in the, in the old, uh, the, sorry, the gospels, it, uh, describes the tomb as kind of this rock, rocky place where the, a rock was uh, rolled in front of the, the entranceway. Uh, we kind of have this sarcophagus looking uh, thing right here, which is meant to evoke this, this idea of the tomb that Jesus was laid in. And here we have the women who are walking towards this tomb. So this would be like Mary Magdalene and some of her friends as they go on, you know, essentially Easter Sunday to find that Jesus's tomb is empty. And so this is a moment of redemption and rebirth, just as this adjacent physical feature in the space is a symbol of renewal and rebirth through baptism. And of course, we have this movement towards the tomb, and it mimics the movement towards the baptismal uh, pool here. Um, and so women uh, played an important role in early baptisms, especially for other women, uh, because usually the initiate was naked. And so a man, you know, would not have been able to see a female, another female initiate naked. So women uh, helped uh, female initiates to be baptized. So this, this is a, a gendered space. Uh, but a shared space. And I love that the women here are playing such an important role within the space. And there they are. Um, we also have a moment from the Bible when Jesus heals a woman with a flow of blood. This is another image from the catacombs of Saints Peter and Marcellinus. So we looked at um, that other imagery of, of Jonah. Um, and so here we have a, another ambiguous kind of image. This man here, he's gesturing towards this female figure who's kneeling. Um, again, totally ambiguous, but very, if you know, you know, right? You, if you know the Christian background, you get a sense. Um, and so this is Jesus, again, beardless, 
youthful looking, gesturing towards the figure and kind of this speech. And um, she is crouching and she's touching his garment because in the book of Matthew, it says, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him, Jesus, and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch this cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her and said, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. So again, Apollo is associated with healing. Jesus is associated with healing. So this youthful appearance, this Apollo-like uh, appearance is appropriate. Um, but again, uh, this, this healing um, is also appropriate for the funerary context in which uh, this fresco appears. We also have images of these orange figures. And I, I like this because it smashes together so many of the things that we've, we've been talking about. So here we have Jonah and the serpent like whale has in theory just spit him out and he's laying like Endymion underneath this, uh, this shelter that God has created. Here we have a male figure enthroned reading a scroll. And we have this female figure here who's in the what we call the orange position. She's um, praying. We have the good shepherd here. And then this is a scene from the Old Testament when um, Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac. And we see the Holy Spirit coming down uh, kind of in the symbol of a dove saying, hey, Abraham, you don't have to you don't have to kill him. So no direct references to Christianity perfectly, right? We could read this very differently, um, but very clear references to Christianity through Jonah, through this orange figure, through the good shepherd, and then um, this sacrifice of a son, Abraham sacrificing his son, God sacrificing his son. So this alignment with the crucifixion here. Um, so it's not clear if this would have been for a female Christian or a male Christian. And we don't know um, the identity because uh, the, the uh, faces are not carved. Um, and this can be for a couple of reasons. Uh, one would be the whoever was laid to rest in the sarcophagus died too quickly for the artist to finish the portrait. Or it could be that the family didn't have enough money for the portraits to get carved. Um, so it could be a, a couple of things. Sometimes these types of sarcophagus were also uh, made for sale, and then you could get the portrait carved later. So you would just select the sarcophagus from like the stock that the, the stone carver already had uh, available. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have enough money after that, after you've purchased this really beautiful and ornate sarcophagus, you might not have enough money to get that done. But uh, it's likely that only a learned couple would have been attracted to this kind of sarcophagus. So we get a sense of their identity um, and what they wanted us to know about them from this sarcophagus. This is uh, an exciting image for many uh, feminist <laughs> art historians. Um, one scholar is adamant that this illustrates a female bishop. Um, and she thinks that it is a female bishop um, because the figure, obviously a female with the veil over her head. We also see her name, Cerula in pace, so this is Latin, so her name is Cerula, in peace. And then these books here, um, we see Marcus, uh, Matthäus, uh, Luca, and then this is Johannes, so this is the four gospel books. And during the um, initiation of a bishop, the gospels are held, were held over a bishop's head. Uh, and so the uh, scholar interprets these kind of floating books as the, this moment when the books are hold, held over the bishop's head when he or she is being initiated. I don't think that that's the case. Um, there is 
a an Irish saint, Saint Bridget of, of Kildare, um, who is miraculously made a bishop. Um, we don't have a story or a legend about a Cerula being sort of miraculously made a bishop. Um, because these floating books, I don't know, that seems like it would be quite, you know, something miraculous. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, and then this, this particular scholar, she interprets these little things coming out of the sides of the book as flames. So this would sort of add to the mystical um, properties, you know, of, of a moment when someone is being miraculously made a bishop. Again, there, there's no story of that. Um, I just have a feeling this is a prominent Christian woman who is very learned, um, was a leader of the church in Naples in the fifth century. She must have been quite wealthy. I have a feeling these things coming out of the sides of the books are, even today, um, if you go to a mass, the, the priest will have a book with many tags coming out of it and they're basically bookmarks. Right. So I have a feeling these are just references to those bookmarks. And we see these bookmarks, um, they're a little bit difficult, but you can see them especially right here, um, coming out of these books that are being held by these personifications of, this is uh, Jewish uh, Christians and this is Gentile Christians. Um, so these women are these personifications of this group of people. Um, and these are from mosaics um, in Santa Sabina in Rome. Santa Sabina is one of the still standing uh, and earliest churches that was constructed. Um, and so it's a, it's a really wonderful example of early Christian architecture and decoration. Um, and here we have this, uh, this pose that, that they're speaking as well. So we have some of these common images of, you know, mortal women, um, imposed on these personifications of the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Um, so if we just go back briefly, we have Cerula in this orant pose, very similar to the female figure here. Um, she's identified as a devout Christian. She is in theory per, uh, uh, well versed in these gospel texts. And then above her head, we again have this Cairo symbol, right? And then just below that, we have the alpha and the omega letters. And this is this uh, concept of the beginning and the end, that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. So these are um, some additional symbols of, of Christian identity and theology. So women appear um, in, in ways that promote their piety, promote their learnedness, um, sometimes promote their wealth. And we see this also in this pix, which is just a small round container. Um, and this has the women at Christ's tomb. Again, they're in these architectural spaces with these beautiful columns. They're in the orant pose. And um, they have these beautiful textiles that are, they're draping their, uh, their bodies. Um, and so this is a little bit more roughly made than some of the other ivory carvings that we've looked at today, but um, still an important uh, piece. And these types of things may have held um, material like the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the uh, blessed bread uh, that is blessed during the, the mass. So it may have held that, um, but we're not sure. It, it could have held, you know, other important textiles. Um, if the, the woman who uh, owned this, I, I presume it was a woman, she may have put uh, a contact relic in there, or I don't know. I, I, I kind of pick up dirt from kind of holy sites and like keep it in little containers. Perhaps it was something like that. Uh, so we, we're not sure, but some scholars do want to say that this, this held the Eucharist and I'm just not sure. Uh, so again, women were wanting to promote their, their identity as learned, um, as speaking and teaching 
their community and as as pious in these these prayerful orant poses. So the house and the household were the problem. Maureen, can I ask yeah. a question? Please. Uh, going back to the pics. Yes. Image. Yes. There are holes. Yes. <laughs> in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And what, I mean, I can think of any number of possibilities, but do you have some thoughts as to why? I have a feeling that there were some decorations some metal decorations, maybe uh, gold, maybe silver, um, and that they were removed later okay. um, to melt down, to sell, things like mm -hmm. that. What What were you thinking they might be? Um, that it might have held something in a fluid form that uh, would need to be drained or um, aerated or something. I don't know, something like that. That's, that's absolutely possible as well. Um, there were these um, shrines uh, of saints that were associated with springs, or sometimes there was like an, a miraculous flow of oil. There was this um, soldier saint whose tomb had this miraculous flow of oil. So yeah, it's possible that um, it could have held one of these materials. Um, you wouldn't have wanted those to drain out though, so. Yeah, no, I think your yeah. idea is much better. <laughs> I think well, when I look at it, because it looks like there's a stain around, yeah. you know, that area that might have held some metal, uh, and right. then there's some up at the top over here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. No, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I just have a feeling, you know, maybe it was, I don't know, with the staining, it looks like it might have been bronze or something, right, with the kind of greenish color. But um, yeah, I have a feeling it was they were stuck something stuck in there and they have the, these kind of things in their eyes as well i wonder if there were like mm. there as well so yeah great question thank you so the house and the household was the province of women and again this made them the perfect people to be early christian leaders because they were opening their houses to people um many of times these women were elite wealthy women who could read from the Bible, could share meals with many people. Um, and so the earliest Christian monuments um, for uh, the mass were the home. And so let's, let's just explore, uh, I'll try to be fast, um, the, the origins. Um, so elite women, um, all women, but elite women had more restricted movements. Um, even imperial women were kind of bound to this uh, gynecaeum, this section just for women in the palace. It's likely that non-elite women could move around in space more freely. Uh, they had to make money for their families, so they were plowing fields, they were out in the market selling things, they were running after children, etc. But elite women were expected to remain within the household and, um, you know, maintain and teach their children from within the household. All women, uh, regardless of social status, attended public events, especially religious ceremonies and festivals. And so for elite women, these must have been super exciting times because it was the times when they could go about freely, um, they could talk to their friends, uh, they could see what other people were wearing, what other people were doing. So uh, for elite women especially, these must have been really exciting. But this also meant that everyone was watching them. So yes, you could meet with your friends, but if you caught the the eye of a you know attractive guy, uh, you know you wouldn't want anyone to see that because you know they could make up stories. Uh, so there's this tension with these these this public movement of women. Uh, women controlled the household. A good wife was someone uh, was a woman who had perfect control. She managed all the slaves. She managed all the uh, economic uh, affairs of the household. And again, just as we read last week from the Xenophon, their inherent abilities made them the best suited for indoor work while men were best suited for it, the, the outdoor work. Again, thus for a woman to bide tranquilly at home rather than roam abroad is no dishonor. But for a man to remain indoors instead of devoting himself to outdoor pursuits is a thing 
uh, discreditable. So again, this is Xenophon uh, in 400 BC. He goes on to say, over those who, whose appointed tasks are wrought indoors, it will be your duty to preside, yours to receive, and this is, he's talking to his wife, um, this, this character, yours to receive the stuffs brought in, yours to apportion part for daily use, and yours to make provision for the rest, to guard and garner it so that the outgoings destined for a year may not be expended in a month. It will be your duty when the wools are introduced to see that clothing is made for those who need, your duty also to see that the dried corn is rendered fit and serviceable for food. There is just one of all these occupations which devolve upon you, I added, you may not find so altogether pleasing. Should any one of, your, of our household fall sick, it will be your care uh, to see and to tend to them to the recovery of their health. And the, the wife says, nay, she answered, that will be my pleasantest of tasks if careful nursing may touch the springs of gratitude and leave them friendlier than before. And I was struck with admiration at her answer and replied, thank you, my wife. It is through some such traits of forethought seen in their mistress leader that the hearts of bees are one and they are so loyally affectioned towards her that if ever she abandon her hive, not one of them will dream of being left behind but one and all must follow her. So again, this ideal B that we saw in the Simonides poem is conveyed in this, this uh, story here. Um, and the, the character, the male character is talking to his friend about how wonderful his wife is. He's talking about, she's just the perfect wife. And so this is an example of her perfection. But it also gives us a sense of what women were expected to do and how they were expected to behave. And so she's, she's acting, she's, responding, you know, positively, but uh, in this kind of humble way that still puts her below her husband. We have no uh, perfect examples of a Byzantine house, um, and this is because things have been built over. Um, and so this is an area where I'm always encouraging my students to, to proceed, um, to look into these archeological remains. And the artifacts that we do have from Byzantine homes are predominantly found in one room or area. Um, wall decorations can be helpful um, and documents, documents might hint at specific uses for different areas, but we still have a lot of questions. Let's see, I have something in the chat. Oh. Thanks, Irene. So Byzantine houses were based basically on the Roman Domus. And this is a elite home. Most people in Rome lived in basically tenements or kind of apartments. Um, they didn't have kitchens or bathrooms. Uh, bathrooms were public um, and pretty gross. <laughs> um, uh, bathing was also uh, performed in public spaces. Um, and so the Roman Domus that we're looking at here would have been an elite person. This may have had a kitchen, um, but the Roman Domus was the province uh, of the woman, um, but it's also where a man would perform many of his business transactions. Um, and so we have the uh, taberna here. These would have been rented out to other people who could have had their, their stores or their shops from these spaces here. And then a visitor to a Roman Domus would enter here through this space, which is called the falcus, which means the jaws. So you're entering through this, literally a mouth of the, the space. And then you would enter into this space, which is the atrium. And as you can see, there was this uh, opening to the, to the air. This allowed for light to come in, but it also allowed for this impluvium. And this is where the water of the household would be collected. So this is would have been rainwater. Um, and this is the, uh, for ritual use and for domestic use here. Uh, and then beyond this, we have the tablinum. Um, and this is where the man of the house would conduct any of his business, uh, politics, uh, you know, arranging marriages of his female family members, etc. cetera. Uh, so this was the space for the man. The other rooms are, would have been the spaces of the woman. Um, and then this is the hortus, and this would have been the garden. And so uh, men could meet here and then go out and enjoy the garden. 
The other space for um, specifically men was the triclinium. And this is the dining room where there would have been three couches, triclinos, three couches. Um, and they would have been here. And this is basically the dining room. This is where men could meet and talk with their friends uh, a little bit more casually. Women were permitted in this space as well. In a very fancy uh, Paris style domus, uh, we find many of these in Pompeii and they just have this extra space here, this Paris style garden. And you can see that it's um, more open to the sky here and it would have had this colonnade of kind of a porch area, a covered uh, area. Uh, they remind me a lot of like a cloister in a medieval um, monastery, but, but basically the same footprint. And so it is these spaces that inform the uh, house churches of the early Christians. Um, and many uh, of these house churches had an atrium and then one of the spaces here on the side would have been where the baptistry would appear. Um, and that's how the uh, house church at Dura Europos, um, uh, the footprint of, of that church uh, works as well. Many women, especially in Greek homes rather than Roman homes, were uh, sort of enclosed in the gynecaeum, um, and these were women's quarters. Uh, this is especially true for the imperial women. Um, they would have been, the empress and her retinue would have been kind of closed off in this gynecaeum. Um, textual references indicate that these places existed, but we don't have any archeological evidence of this. Uh, so it may have really been just the imperial household. Um, so we have this conflicting evidence. Um, it's really difficult for us to, to, to fully understand um, how, this how, this, how these spaces worked or if they, they actually existed. A lot of times uh, textual references indicate the ideal not reality. So it may have been the ideal to have a gynecaeum. Reality, it just didn't work. You couldn't really have a gynecaeum for various reasons. Uh, finances, women had to work, they had to be outside, etc. So there are, there are a number of different possibilities for this. In a text by Tekov Manos in the, from the 11th century, it does, he does say, keep your daughters confined like criminals. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, this could be the ideal and not, not the reality. Xenophon also indicates that there was a gynecaeum. Um, he says, then I showed her the women's apartments separated from the men's apartments by a bolted door, whereby nothing from within could be conveyed without clandestinely, nor children born and bred by our domestics without our knowledge and consent, no unimportant matter. Since if the act of rearing children tends to make good servants still more loyally disposed, cohabiting but sharpens ingenuity for mischief in the bad. So again, we're not sure if this, these, act these spaces actually existed. Within the homes, we have a number of um, archaeological um, artifacts that demonstrate what women were doing inside. Um, so here we have a spindle. And this was used to, uh, in the pr uh, production of, of thread, essentially. And then the thread would have been used for uh, weaving. And so you would use this to sort of weight down one end of your thread as you, as you twisted it. Um, and then the, the needles here were obviously used for embroidery, sewing textiles together after they had been woven, um, etc. So various purposes here. And then in other uh, artifacts, we have additional um, references to women's work with textiles. And I really love this weaver's comb. So we have the comb end here, and we have these little cherubs here. And this seems to be a saint of some kind. She is holding a crucifix. And then she also has this crown on her head. And this crown 
might be a symbol of a, a town or a, uh, a city, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, something like that. Um, and this connection to Christianity is quite clear. We have these cherubs, these, these columns here framing the figure. But I just love that religion was so important uh, <laughs> that it's just on this, this weaver's comb. Um, so they would have used this to weave, uh, to, to comb out some of the, um, uh, sorry, the, the weaving um, as they were uh, pressing it to, to make a flat um, textile. And uh, it's also this association with possibly the personification of this city, this Christian identity of the city. So perhaps this was someone who was creating textiles, was weaving for the city, uh, for the emperor or something like that. Um, but I, I just really love this. It's so fabulous. And then in this funerary Stella of an ordinary woman, we have this division of the gender uh, spaces here. So the male is illustrated here, the female is here. And instead of symbols of her learning, she has symbols of her femininity. So here we have the spindle and the distaff, uh, which are symbolic of her work with textiles. Uh, I have a feeling this is a mirror. So <laughs> her attention to her appearance. Sometimes mirrors were symbols of vanity, which you might not want to have on your, your Stella, your funerary Stella. Um, but this may be a symbol of her attention to her appearance, maybe symbolic that she was a beautiful woman. And then, uh, so over here we have these grapes and these vines. So perhaps this was uh, a maker, a wine, a uh, maker of wine, or someone who tended a vineyard. Uh, above them, we have the Christ figure in this mandorla, um, and so we get a sense that this, this is a Christian couple, but they are focused on their sort of worldly tasks and their careers. So here we have the spindle and the distaff. And within these spaces, um, they would have been found in one of these cubicula here on the side. Um, and so this is a house plan from Athens. And what's great about this one is that we actually have this apsidal space here. Um, this may have been a dining room, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious if it was also a baptistry. It's, it's not entirely clear what these spaces um, would have been used for. I'm just gonna jump past this one just for a moment. And this one. Okay. All right. Uh, women um, had various life events that would have been extremely important to them, and they marked their passage uh, in age. Women were usually married but, but by the age of 12, 13, 14, 15, so at the onset of monarchy. Um, women usually married much older men. Men were expected to marry later in life. And once a woman was married, she was expected to produce children as quickly as possible and as frequently as possible. Uh, this resulted in um, probably a, a fair amount of trauma for the woman. Um, birth giving was extremely dangerous, it still is. And there was also um, this aspect of, you know, if women were, were expected to produce children all the time, they may have had too many children. They couldn't afford these children. So we do have examples of, of children being left uh, on the sides of roads, essentially, after they're born, to either die of exposure or to be picked up by someone who's traveling and can adopt them, essentially. Um, Many times these, these children were picked up and put into slavery though. So there were, you know, it was hard to be, <laughs> to be uh, young in, in these times. Um, so these stories of like Romulus and Remus where uh, some shepherds just happened to find these, these babies, this is actually sort of rooted in reality that babies would have just been sort of found um, from time to time. Uh, 
death in childbirth was extremely common. Death in childhood was extremely common. If a child made it to the age of six, that was really amazing. And then if that child made it to the age of 18, that was especially amazing. So um, many children suffered from hunger. Uh, they suffered from malnutrition. Uh, they suffered from any illness, um, broken arms, broken legs. Um, there are many things that a child could be prone to. Um, especially in Egypt, we have children who are attacked by other animals, attacked by stinging insects and things like that. So fraught with danger. Um, the other possibility was that an older husband would die of an illness or die in battle leaving very young wives with sometimes many, many children. So this, this could be quite a challenge. Um, and again, this is where we get this, um, this uh, dissonance with the, the ideal and the reality that we see in some of the textual, the textual references. Virginity was extremely important, especially um, after the advent of Christianity. Um, prior to Christianity, women, elite women especially, were expected to remain virgins until their marriage. Um, and so this carries over into Christianity. But after the advent of Christianity, vir virginity sort of supersedes um, marriage in some ways. Um, and Gregory of Nyssa talks about how, uh, and Gregory of Nyssa is one of the early church fathers, how virginity is the natural state, so it's a superior to marriage, like you're born a virgin, right? So just remain a virgin. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the constant fear of losing a spouse or a child that you would get in marriage. So, you know, if you're, if you remain a virgin and you never get married, you, you don't have to experience that loss, so it's better. Um, you know, we can, we can agree or disagree with him on that. Um, marriages could also unite families, and we see this especially prominently among the imperial families. This could was a way to sort of barter contracts, barter peace agreements, um, especially with young women from uh, warring or, or um, oppositional families or political uh, groups. And so marriage was one of the most important aspects of a young woman's life. And I'll try to, I'll try to go quickly. Um, so we have a number of these really beautiful rings. And so we see here the woman um, and her husband. And then their names are inscribed on this ring. I just love this. Um, and so the inscription is there. I actually can't read it very well. So I can't tell you what it says. Um, and these kind of facing uh, portraits like this, profile portraits are based on many other classical traditions. This is the Gemma Claudia, which illustrates um, Claudius um, and Agrippina the Younger with Germanicus and his wife Agrippina the Elder. And then we have the symbol of Jupiter in the center, this cornucopia that, that uh, symbolizes the, the health and wonderfulness of Claudius's reign. And so this is applied onto Christian rings as well. Uh, here we have, again, these, these facing profile portraits with the cross in the middle symbolizing their Christian identity. Um, and the marriage belts that we have are really wonderful. This would have been able to fit um, a woman's waist about a size 12 um, in the US today. So pretty small. And we see these facing figures joining hands like this, and then between them is Jesus here. Um, and so then we have these other symbols of, around the exterior. And so this would have been given in the marriage ceremony and then sort of ritualistically removed um, as the uh, marriage was consummated. Uh, so this is a deeply symbolic uh, element of the marriage. So here's the, a close-up view of the, the center belt buckles. So here we have the female. She's beautifully dressed in this very traditional, modest garment. The male here looks like a soldier. And then Jesus bearded in the center with the halo. This is one of my favorite rings. Um, it has um, 
uh, both Mary and Jesus in the center, sort of gesturing towards the uh, male and female. So we have the male here and the female here. We have Mary on this side and Jesus on this side. And I know it's really difficult to see, but you just have to believe me that this is Mary and this is Jesus. You can kind of get a sense of the beard here that indicates uh, Jesus here. And then there's no beard that would indicate Mary. On the exterior of this ring, we have wonderful images from the life of Jesus and the life of Mary. So here we have the Annunciation, the Visitation. This is when, uh, this is the Nativity. Uh, this is when Jesus is presented at the, um, uh, the temple. Uh, and then we have some symbols of um, the, the, um, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and so since bearing children was so important. It's, it's significant these, that these images of the nativity are on this ring, right? So this is kind of imbuing the woman with this ability to, to have children. Uh, and this one is also wonderful. We have the male on the left, the female on the right, Jesus in the center. Um, okay, I think that's where I'm gonna end for today and I've already gone over. So does anybody have any questions? Okay, questions for Maureen. Well, I'll ask one then. You Great. mentioned the, these sarcoph sarcophagi that mm -hmm. are so elaborately carved. How long would it take to do that? I mean, so you would have to, were people anticipating their deaths to get these elaborate th things done, et cetera? Yes. And um, of course, if you were wealthy, you wanted to ensure that the idea of your wealth was promoted after your death. So you would kind of save up for these beautiful, beautiful sarcophagi and you would probably hire, you know, if you were really wealthy, you could hire an artist, a stone carver to make, you know, a special bespoke sarcophagus for you. Um, but again, if you ran out of money, um, sometimes we see this partially finished sarcophagi. Um, but yes, people would anticipate dying, and just like we plan our funerals today, they would sort of plan their funerals in this way. Yeah, yeah. great question. Yeah. Um, in one of the earlier images, you had pictures of uh, these figures, and the women had cloth coming down over their arms. Let's go back to that. And I wondered why they, they both had, as a, it was one of the very early, early yes. pictures. Yes. So, but I think this, this, this demonstrates what you're talking about, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is called a Mephorian. And it's basically a poncho <laughs> with a veil. Oh. Yeah. And so it was just a, a garment that many women wore. Sometimes they were kind of diaphanous, like in the images of the Virgin that you're talking about. Um, they are sort of, um, you know, transparent. Um, but other times they were heavy. Um, but it was just a uh, modesty that women were. Oh, promoting. okay. And mm -hmm. sometimes that sometimes it would be just a strip of cloth coming mm -hmm. down over the arm. Okay. Yes. Thank so thank you. You're welcome. So the early Roman women would wear togas and they would wrap the toga over their arm. So only one arm was like free to move around. And then one arm was sort of like wrapped up in the toga and then the toga would wrap over their heads as well. So it's just kind of a, a riff, if yeah. you will, on that kind of covering. But this is called a Mephorian. Yeah, great and question. And it was always, always for, for women, right? That's correct. Yes. Men did okay. not have to wear that. Men could have exposed okay. heads. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great question. Anybody? That's a fabulous talk. Oh, thank I'm you. so glad you enjoyed it. You're welcome. I love the art. Oh, Wonderful. me too. Me too. Absolutely incredible. Well, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, it's beautiful thank stuff. Thank you for coming you're and bringing it to us. Oh, I love it. That's how did good. you find all how did you how did you find all these early christian images and sculpture pieces so uh not too long ago uh, about 15 or 20 years ago um the one of the uh primary um 
museums of this type of material is in Washington, D.C. It's part of Harvard and it's called the Dumbarton Oaks. Oh, yeah. I've and, been there. Yes. And so they actually uh, had a exhibition about women um, in Byzantium and late antiquity. So I, I'm very blessed to have had that uh, <laughs> museum catalog. It's very helpful. I, I, I reference it all the time. <laughs> I have a question for you, Maureen. Please. Um, are there any records of the way, I mean, we have records of men telling their wives how they should do their duty and all that stuff, but do we have any records of women uh, experiencing what their lives were like, explaining it or recording it? No. Because no. I suspect they have a different take on this. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is always something that I'm trying to speculate, um, and I encourage my students to speculate, so I encourage you you to speculate. Because uh, it's one thing that we do have, and it's absolutely tantalizing for me, because it's a man who wrote about this event that only women participated in. Only women. And even that tells us nothing <laughs> about how women experienced this women's only event. Um, I can't think of the name of it, but it was basically all the women who worked in the Weavers Guild in Constantinople, and they would have this event, um, and they would go to the church, and they would do all of these things, and there's, uh, he tells us about um, this one particular ritual where <laughs> the women would um, hit each other, but it's, it's, we don't know why or if it was actual hitting or if they were just sort of joking and hitting each other or, or anything like that. The only thing that, we, that comes close is, um, I think it's Gregory of Nyssa. He talks about one of his sisters and he loved his sisters very, very much. And he was extremely proud of them. He was extremely respectful of them. And so he does write about one of his sisters. And so we get a little bit of that, but he's writing about how ascetic she was and how her life of extreme austerity. And mm -hmm. so this is kind of an outlier female, right? She's not having the normal experience of like, I don't know, someone like me or, you know, any of my friends, right? Um, so. Yeah, well, I, I wonder, I wonder if there were such texts that have been lost or yet to be found. I, I hope it's the second one. I hope we just haven't <laughs> found them yet. But um, because men were responsible for recording, you know, making copies of books and texts and if they didn't think it was important or they weren't teaching it in school they weren't going to copy it so yeah they're probably lost but i really hope we just haven't found them yeah. <laughs> all right thank you great question okay well maybe we've 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 exhausted it then for today okay. thank you very much marie you're welcome and so one week from today, and yes. we will send the reminder. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a and great let, weekend. And let me remind everybody that the general meeting is this Sunday, and uh, going to have an interesting speaker is Greg Gelbert, who is professor in environmental studies, and he's looking at the health of forests around the world, but on the Santa Cruz campus too. And he has this interesting project that involves our students kind of monitoring what is happening to the forest in Santa Cruz. So hope to see you all on Sunday also. Great. Okay, thanks, Marie. You're welcome, take care. Bye.